Hi, everyone. Welcome to Office Hours. Uh, if you are watching on YouTube and you see a link down below, uh, you, you can actually join this conversation here in Zoom. If you're here in Zoom and you're an attendee and you're probably wondering, you're watching all these folks and you're thinking, I could do better. I know better than these folks, these jokers. You might. And we'd love to have you. So uh, if you uh, if you want to be part of this conversation, maybe part of the panel, uh, we open at six. You don't have to be here at six, but we open at six and start talking. I mean, and that conversation between six and six thirty is one of my favorites, but it's, I can't promise anything. We're wandering around uh, at six forty. We do uh, the mic checks, uh, mic checks. Once we do the mic checks, we've closed the panel. Um, so all you need to do is have good audio, good video, good Internet and, um, you know, something to say. And but we'd love to have you here. Uh, if you're interested in joining our panel. If you are going to stay as an attendee, which is totally fine, uh, you're, you do have a job. There's no slackers here. Uh, you need to ask questions, ask questions and vote on those questions. You are the producers for the show. So uh, if you look at Makana, there's a link in the chat to Makana. And if you go to Makana, you can uh, uh, go there and have chats. And you can also ask questions, ask those questions, vote those questions up. The best thing to do is to think about those questions all day. So their office hours never really leaves. And so you can uh, think about those questions when things pop up, write them down somewhere and then bring them in and, uh, and bring them up uh, for us to, to take a look at. So uh, the first hour is all dedicated to your questions. Uh, second hour, we basically break into a vertical. So uh, Mondays are kind of wild cards. We do a lot of different things. Uh, Tuesdays are uh, sound and audio. Uh, Wednesdays are camera. Thursdays are artists. Uh, Fridays are events and, and Saturdays are education. Um, and uh, you can check in the Discord. Uh, we do have a Discord. Uh, you have to be here at 640 to get the link. After, by the time I start talking about it here, it's it's already expired. So um, so the uh, but you can join see Discord to see the uh, the the um, schedule. And we also send it out every morning uh, if you're subscribed here in Zoom. So um, we're going to go ahead and jump into the questions. Bill, are you able to do questions today? Can you manage the questions here? Yes, I can. Let me start right. popping them over. Okay. What do we have? The first one comes from Victor on the panel. Can Mickey or anyone else talk more about input and output routing possibilities using sound devices units? I find it complex. So if only we had, if only we had somebody from sound devices, I, I, it would be amazing. Yeah. Oh, that. wait. Imagine that. So for those of you who don't know John Tatulis, uh, John is the uh, founder and CEO of Sound Devices. And he was kind enough uh, to, uh, we, this question covered at the very end. And I was like, hey, John, can you come and talk to us? How's it going, John? <laughs> Good morning. Well, actually, to technically get that correct, Matt Anderson is the CEO. So Matt is oh, my is? business partner. What are you? He is. Uh, what you know, what are you? You're free I'm, floating? I'm trying to be as free floating as possible. I'm trying to... Uh, <laughs> Uh, you know, not have anybody directly report to me, which would be, which is, we're getting close to that. And that's a wonderful thing. But uh, yeah, so, you know, we do get that question a lot on the mix pre's and the eight series. And, you know, the routing is really comprehensive. And if you look at a little mix pre, it's, it's pretty straightforward. So, you know, I just switch my camera here. The little mix pre is really pretty accessible. You know, it's uh three inputs with microphone ins, one, two, three, and then you've got a main left, right bus. But underneath that, we've got a lot of depth in terms of the ability to send inputs to USB and USB to tracks or, and audio channels to tracks. So it all depends on what you're looking to do. So for instance, in a routing like this, uh, where I'm using a microphone source and I want to send that to a stream. I may just take a microphone input, connect that directly, and I'll take my left right mix and I may send that off to Zoom. And I'll do that over a USB connection. So we can go in here and to the outputs and we select our USB one. Now, oftentimes you'll just send that tracks left and right and you'll have input one sent to left, right. The trouble is depending on the streaming software, for instance, Zoom will take all USB inputs and sum them together with a multi-channel input device. So it becomes a little tricky. So you wanna be careful. And the way I typically would set up a device going into Zoom is I would have my inputs going to my left and right mix, but I would take the USB outputs and I would source them 
from the uh, from the left right out. So I would send left USB, USB two. I would send that to one and two would be the left USB one and two. So what that gives you is the ability to apply a delay because it all depends on what version of firmware I have on the specific unit, but I can apply a delay. Uh, guess what? I don't have the most recent version of firmware on this device, but I could apply a delay to those left, right outputs on a USB pre so that I can match my sound and picture. So, you know, in a typical scenario, I've got, um, you know, I might have my camera coming in as a separate chain and that's going to come in later than my audio. My audio is going to land much earlier. So I can dial in delay at the outputs on a US on a, on a mix pre. You can also do this on the eight series and, and such. So uh, the, the power is that you want to send only to those outputs, the local audio system that you have here. And then your return audio is going to come in and you're not going to route that to those left, right paths. So it essentially gives you a mix minus. And the, the, the connection in the, the mix pre is, it takes a little time to get used to routing audio. It's a little, you know, it's, it's not as easy as a bigger device. You know, the eight series routing is far more comprehensive and simple with uh, the multiple buses. The mix pre is more limited, but you can accomplish many of the things you can in the bigger brothers. <clears throat> does that answer your question, Victor? Do you have any other questions about that? <clears throat> yeah, it generally does. The thing that confuses me, I have a mix pre six too, and mm -hmm. um, I get confused with the um, USB buses, you know, uh, one and two versus five and six. Is five and six the one coming back to me or is one and two? And it just becomes a jumble in my brain. I have to have Mickey uh, call me from the Philippines and help me <laughs> set it up. <laughs> well, remember that the USB outs are going to be from the device sent to the machine. So when you look in your, you know, sound and, uh, you know, devices in your computer, you'll see all those output streams showing up. And our default is that we send numerous output streams to each of those outputs. So the, the normal factory default is input one goes to USB one, input two goes to two, three, and so on. And even the left, right mix get routed. I think when you're setting up a system for video conference or live stream, you want to kind of zero all those out. And then you want to very specifically send input sources out to USB destinations. Because if you don't do that and you don't know exactly where the machine is going, you may end up with a feedback loop or some kind of an echo loop. So we, we sometimes hear customers getting those because there might be the left, right, for instance, the main, you know, left, right tracks end up being routed to USB, but that's what you're listening on headphones. And then you get this echo. So the default you, advanced feature is not going to necessarily hit it. I'm, I'm probably going to have to go in there and zero some of those yeah. out so that I get very specific routing from this mic to a USB out that I want to go to, right? Right. Yeah. Go ahead, Mickey. Thank you. Uh, yeah, uh, like, because because Victor, you you might be a bit more uh, used to like the more traditional interfaces like the UA um, unit right. that you have. Um, the Mix P6 specifically, the one that you have, is if you think of it in the terms of that a company like UA might use, it's an eight by four interface. You have eight streams of audio coming into the computer, and you have four poss possible streams coming out of the computer going back to the device. So like that uh, USB assignment that uh, John was showing us earlier, there there should be eight of those, I, I, I believe, on the Mix Pre 6. And again, like, yeah, you could assign exactly which uh, source goes to the stream that goes to the computer in the same way back around. And then uh, Courtney? Morning, John. Uh, yeah, I have one of the original Mix Pre 3s, so it's not a version 2, so unfortunately I don't have all the fun uh, uh, noise noise assist and such. But yeah, I ran into a problem routing because I wanted to be able to hear 
my microphone and anything else I brought in on the mix pre in my earphone. And I also needed to hear back from the Zoom, from the Zoom conference, also in my mono earphone. So is there a, and I would constantly get that, what you were talking about, uh, you know, oscillating feedback uh, loop uh, from Zoom. Uh, if I used the Mix Pre 3 as both my microphone source and as my speaker source, coming back with the USB back into the uh, Mix Pre from Zoom. Is there a way to route that so that I can hear both the return USB and my own mic going out uh, and balance going out without getting into a feedback loop in the headphones. Yes, and if you're on the most recent version of firmware now, some of the versions support different routings. The the, mm -hmm. the Mixpre 2s, I'll just speak for the current model with the current firmware, you can take inputs and route them directly to the left right output bus. And what that allows you to do is essentially bypass your left right tracks. Now, normal, your left right tracks, which are the recorded tracks, are your um, are what you're going to listen in headphones. So you're going to listen to that and you're going to have your local audio and you're going to have your USB return audio and you're going to have that in headphones so you can hear yourself plus return program. What you can do and you can send your local sources, so if that's only one microphone or one or two microphones, send that directly to the left right outputs and send the outputs over USB to USB outs. And that will essentially give you another bus and you can exclude your low, the return audio over USB. Let's say that's coming in, at, in input number three, exclude that and don't send that to your output left and right. And that way you will have essentially a mix minus sent to the output but your track and your, your left right track will be fully intact with your local and the return. You can record that for podcasting applications and you can monitor that in headphones. So the trick to avoiding the feedback is to route the, re the return audio <clears throat> from, which would be the speaker audio in, in Zoom to USB three and then pipe that into the headphone feed somehow without getting feedback. Well, you're gonna, you're gonna send that, you're gonna have that turned up and it's going to go to the left right tracks but tracks are different than output oh, so you could you can actually go into the routing and no send audio. directly to the output the stereo out only your local audio mm -hmm. and then with uh you know with the mixpre 2 series you can apply delay to that so only delay would it be appearing on that output so when you're hearing it in the headphones it's going to ha sound in real time and then what's going out to your stream will match your picture and you'll have the delay applied. I see. Okay, I'll have to spend a couple of thousand hours on that. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Fenwick? Your, uh, your sync is perfect. My sync should be slightly better. Um, I have a mix pre six, bought it on Alex's uh, recommendation. I love it. The, the noise assist is magic. Um, I was wondering if it would be a benefit. Well, I have a product idea. And the product idea is as, as dumbed down, as simple as like one of these guys, um, which I'm sure you know. Um, and you could literally make it just for people that need one mic in, it doesn't need to record. It's for streamers. One mic in, the ability to monitor the computer back and have the noise assist. I think that would be an insanely popular product. It also might take away from people buying the Mix Pre 3. And I understand that that's probably a, a good thing to keep selling. Um, also, I think a lot of this stuff, that as, as, as more um, uh, non audio, like for example, I'm not as skilled as Mickey. I needed to get Mickey involved to set up my system, which is working great. Um, but I think that uh, I, I'm thinking about like late '90s era Mackie manuals. Were uh, you could learn audio engineering just by reading their manuals, and I think that putting 
more effort into that. And maybe you've already done it and I just haven't seen it. So then it's a marketing problem. I need to see that. Putting more effort into training people that aren't, you know, Mickey level audio engineers on how to use the inner workings of these would be really beneficial. But I love the product. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, those are great uh, comments. And, you know, our heritage has always come from that audio professional who just needs to know what the device is and what this input is and, and how to control that specific feature. And, you know, that's, that's where we came from. And, you know, the mix pre is somewhat new for us in, in that realm and kind of moves us into a different type of user. And so we're still learning how to communicate with that user and we're working the hard on it, it. Ultimately it's like the curse of success. It's like, yeah, more and, and more we're people, doing video tutorials as educated and, people. Yeah. Well, they're also, um, you know, arguably doing some of the most creative stuff too. So, which is, which is fun because you want them to be successful with the product. And so we're, we're doing videos and things like that. And uh, we find that somebody is oftentimes searching and they're going to watch a video tutorial on, oh, how do I do that versus, uh, you know, deep diving, reading in a manual. Now I still like to deep dive, read in a manual, but uh you know, we're, we're trying to find that balance between both. And, you know, we're always adjusting and tuning and improving. Audio path and signal routing. Sometimes you kind of need that, that overview. And I agree. And, and your videos are great. I learned how to get up and going at, at the basic level by pouring through, you know, pause, you know, click this thing, pause, watching your videos. They're great. Um, but that, that internal routing thing, I think it would really benefit from a, you know, an overview chart schematic you know fun no, easy good suggestion I, I and i and i think this is an industry challenge you know because it's the, the, the easiest the cheapest way to add value to a product is training because you know we talk you know because it's because then people understand how to use it then they become attached to it because they they know how to use this one they don't know how to use another one and so when they invest that time into it it becomes you know i we've talked about it a lot of times where i mentioned my microwave that they spent millions and millions of dollars on all these weird features and all i know how to do is time and power you know, and, and, you know, but that's, you know, that's the, uh, so uh, all that was wasted, like basically all that engineering is wasted. So anything that there isn't training for is not often not being used at all. Like when we, I used to use the 788 for everything. <laughs> like, like, you know, and we would like, I mean, I, you know, we, we'd run whole shows on 788s before we moved to like, uh, you know, Q01s and stuff like that before Brian, you know, and, um, and uh, uh a sound, someone who's a field engineer, you know, field recordist would look at what I was doing with the 788 and just be like, I didn't even have any idea that this thing could do that. And the, you know, and of course the, the Scorpio is at a whole different level of what it's capable of, but it's hard to get, you know, if you're just using it as a recording device, it's worth every penny, but it's got, you know, it can run the whole show, you know, on it as well. And so that's the, the big, big missing part, Sky and then Stuart. John, you have a, a beautiful product and that it runs just on right in to my laptop is, is magical. I am also an editor like Chris and they don't let us out of a dark room very often. So I know there are so many more crayons in your box that I have no idea what they do. So I would love that simple, uh, why do I need this? And did you know sure. that? And if I didn't know Mickey, yeah, I would not have been able to use it. But your price point, is is pretty magical i mean my understanding of audio goes back to the word nagra so um that's where i just want to say thank you for being here and listening and i ran him out of the room <laughs> uh uh okay oh, grabbing oh, a nagra. Oh, oh 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 toys grabbing his nagra. Wait, toys toys oh the nagra oh look at you <laughs> what he was referring to that for those of yeah, you who I've don't know a, what a uh, nagra yeah, this is a this is an Agra 4.2 right here. So this is a uh, analog machine. Takes a bunch of D cell batteries on the bottom side, and uh, you know this is kind of the heritage where we all came from. <laughs> now why? And why uh, this machine still works. Why is it important to learn from the past, not just plug in new tools and make it shiny? <laughs> I, what have you? What we... <laughs> I think it's I think it's important because it's it. it, it you, you have to remember how great it is. Like, I think that part of looking back at the past is looking at how great it is right now. You know, like anytime, I think I thought I said this before, but anytime somebody complained about, uh, 
uh, compositing in After Effects, John Knoll would give us a little lesson on what it took to do optical composites, and then then you would just go, okay, I'm not gonna I'm not gonna complain anymore. <laughs> so you know, and uh, and you know, there's a lot of wondrous things that analog does. Okay, we're gonna go really fast because we're gonna go into our questions here. Stuart, then Victor, and then Mickey. Plus one for what Chris just said, but for all camera manufacturers in the last ten years, there is a dearth of instructional information out there on how to get the best out of your product like you just said it's an industry-wide thing and people just aren't producing those manuals broadcast manuals for eng cameras used to be that thick and you could do everything in them yeah. there's just not that amount of shit right, they just realized anymore not that many people were reading them i think that was the problem go ahead victor Hey, John, just a question. I, I, I have a need to be able to automate MIDI. Any chances that you're going to open up your MIDI in so that I can do some automation like muting channels and stuff through a software? It would be a killer thing for like, you know, one man shows like me. And uh, you're almost there. I would just love it. Please, please. Yeah, those protocols all exist. So, you know, the MCU protocol and the control of the machine. Uh, you know, we can use those external controller devices. So yes, um, you know, again, it's in some ways it's documentation to make sure that that gets presented. Uh, you know, because so the MIDI's are already generally MIDI, MIDI controls already there. Yeah, the way we connect to the uh, you know like the nano controller and some of these external controllers is using the the MCU protocol. So that is uh, you know has been around for a long time. And it's 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 pretty robust and, and standardized. So, a lot of those hooks are there. Uh, it's just you know kind of the enumeration piece of it that needs to you know kind of work with us so that we can kind of enumerate at that level and then we can uh, you know present some of that. But that's that's certainly something for us to explore. Certainly something to think about. Yeah, yeah, you have it for certain pieces. If you can just open the protocol so a piece of software can talk directly to your pro protocol to USB then I can emulate whatever. I mean, the, right. to put it in perspective, it's a discussion that we're going to have more on Thursday, but Victor has like QLab driving uh, an ATEM switcher, you know, from the, from its calls. And so being able to do that with the, with the audio side of things would be useful. Killer. Gotcha. Uh, just, just as a, as a curiosity, how many people here have a mix pre of some sort uh, in the panel? I'm just, just curious. Yeah. So it's, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, just curious. I'm just curious. A lot of us uh, have, been, have been using this. Anyway, John, um, John, thanks so much for uh, jumping in at the last minute uh, to answer that question. That was amazing. It's amazing. Hey, my pleasure. You. Yeah, absolutely. Great to be here. Uh, yeah, absolutely. Um, uh, all right, let's jump on to the, uh, the next question. It took, it took a little while question. on that one, but it was worth it. <laughs> next question comes from the panel's Doug Ferguson. When producing a live show, do you have a big production meeting with the crew or smaller ones in separate groups, camera, in line, and so forth? So uh, anyone else can raise, raise their hand too. Go ahead, Mickey. Yeah, uh, generally speaking, at least like say on, on narrative films, it, multiple pre-production meetings with the entire crew, but on larger shows, like say if you have a crew that like more than 200, more than 300 people, um, usually it's heads that meet and then they disseminate the information to, to the rest of their uh, department members. Go ahead, Kev, and then Alex. Yes, just following on from what Mickey was saying, it's depending on the size of the project, but normally it's you do your heads of department, discuss the outline of the creative decisions that you're going to make, and then, of course, they all translate that to something more pragmatic for each of them. And that's usually disseminated down to the separate departments. And then usually on show day or rehearsal, you do full technical rehearsal, make sure everybody knows what's what, camera blocking, performance, um, rehearse, and then perform. Go ahead, Alex. Uh, on live events, uh, the ones that I remember when I was involved in those, uh, sometimes if we're going on location, we have an initial quick meeting. So we just all get to know each other. And that's probably if it's like two, a couple of hundred people, maybe a little bit more. But in practice, there's no more meetings than that. And that's just a kind of welcome to the thing. And it's as quick as possible. But also the actual PDF that we get in advance usually has a hidden thing somewhere in it. And then during that meeting, there's a little joke in which somebody puts their hand up and says, can I have my free cookie or 
teddy bear, whatever it happens to be, because that was in the PDF, which was the uh, full brief that everyone, and the person who read it first is the one who gets the cookie or whatever it happens to be in that. <laughs> That's good. That's, it's the it's the M and M's, uh, the green M or the or whatever the brown M and M's and green M and M's. The, uh, the for those of you who don't know that that's the, that was the infamous Van Halen thing in their rider would always have removal of all I think it was green or brown or or some color of M and M's and if they didn't have those removed they would check everything you know in the whole yeah but space. there was a good reason for that no, no, it just meant that someone wasn't paying attention to detail so the um, anyway but uh, yeah for us we uh, I think a lot of it also has to, is a function of how good your comms are so and how detailed your comms are so when we have really robust uh, comm systems lots of uh, PLs and directs and so on and so forth. We're able to do a lot of the stuff that you would normally do when we all gather together over radio, you know, not over radio, but over comms. And, you know, we're all sitting there and especially in virtual events, you know, no one's in one place. And so um, we definitely have a lot of all hands. Now we, because we're doing events almost every day, we have all hands in the morning. We have a smaller group in the afternoon where we're just talking about what's coming up and what the challenges are. Um, but for specific large events, um, usually as stated before it's usually per team um and then once it, once we get into it even on the day of the event everyone's just kind of doing their thing but a lot of it has to do with we're obsessed with comms and so we have lots and lots of channels so someone getting used to all those channels is hard but once you do that a lot of those general meetings become less impactful because we're talking all the time about everything you know and it's and it's kind of a um you know getting i think a lot of people underestimate the power of of a good comm system, you know, and, and comms design for, for live events. Go ahead, Courtney, and then Stuart. Yeah, one thing nobody's mentioned yet is is a lot of times on these live shows uh, is a safety meeting where they call everybody together before the show starts, especially if you've got pyro involved and stage effects these days have lots of fireworks and flamethrowers and all kinds of uh, stuff yeah. that can, can burn your face off if you're not standing in the right spot. So you, it's imperative that everybody know where that stuff is and when it's going to go off and uh, stay yep. and that kind of stuff. And and when we, uh, when we currently, when we shoot on site, there's a COVID meeting every morning. That's the one meeting we definitely have is a, just a reminder to keep everybody's, you know, uh, awareness of what they're touching and whether their masks, where the, where it's okay to take your mask off, where it's not, that type of thing. Go ahead, Stuart. Just from the um, low budget end of production and what have you, it doesn't matter if you're low budget, having these sorts of meetings and communication is always a good idea it doesn't matter the size of the production the moment you're communicating and collaborating you get a better product and that's at all levels yeah pre-planning makes more of a difference i would say in low budget than it does in big budget <laughs> in big budget you can you can soften things with money and low I budget you don't anyway. have that so it's so logistics is a is a useful thing all right next question Okay, A. Mitchells is in with a longer one, and it has to do with what we were talking about the last couple of days. Uh, looking for a mini XLR adapter that's compatible with the pile mics and their power needs. Is there an inexpensive TA4 to XLR that uses ba a battery or external power instead of the phantom power, as the laptop 3.5 jacks aren't really doing it so far? And then he talks about the fact that laptop phantom power adapters uh, and and should power the mic fine and something about old audio technical lab and lectern mic power supplies which are kind of gone now so it's really about powering these small microphones in the modern era i think that the only one that we've used is the vlxr plus i think is the the one that i think most of us have have used to, to convert the eighth inch jack um to it for the ta4 um i don't know if there's any Anyone that when you're trying to do power externally, you have to have something that's going to push that power in. And I'm not sure how we go from XLR to go ahead, go ahead, Jeffrey. I have a, a company from, called Micronic, and that's what I use. And, and it's got a T A T four eight, whatever. Uh, and of course, I thought I had it, it on the desk, but I have the adapter from Sure that goes from that to an actual XLR, and that's a uh, under hundred dollars. And what I'm still amazed at is that somebody hasn't come out with a mic and IFB set that just goes to a, to a USB. Like <laughs> just so much money there. There's like tens of millions of dollars just sitting there because you know everybody's trying to buy a mic right now, a headset mic and a and an earpiece, and it's just we're dealing with all this weird analog stuff when we just need something we can plug in and go. You know, it's a kind of an amazing thing. Go ahead, Courtney. Oh, well, there are lots of gamer headsets out there that are USB based. That... No, they look they're ugly. Pro, that dreaded prolific chipset, which goes bad really? for about 
an hour. They're like, but they're also like the the big head. Yeah. Like people, what people want is this, yeah. right? Like this kind of look with with good audio. Yeah, gamer headsets look like Tron. Yeah, it's it's good for gamers. I mean, it's a culture. The the gamer headsets. I mean, the gamer headset is the right thing. Like you go to a gamer headset and just make it a low profile. If Pile or somebody else or Polson or whatever partnered with a gamer headset, they can probably do it relatively quickly. No. All right, next question. Yes, Bill, are you there? Your, your sync is perfect. Hang on a second. I managed to double click. My bad. Uh, Laurel Seal is in with a couple of questions here. What proc amp controls are available inside the ATEM Mini for inputs other than Blackmagic cameras? You definitely want to play with that. So some of the adjustments that the that the ATEMs make are to the camera. They're making calls to the camera. Other ones are literally just proc amp. Uh, 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 um, you know, changes to the overall value. So like your black levels and a lot of your color adjustments, they're not doing anything to the camera. They're making adjustments to the stream that's coming in. And the easiest way to do that is just take up any old input, like a laptop input or whatever, and play around with, or put another camera in there and play around with those controls and see, see which ones, you know, have teeth. You know, your aperture is definitely controlled there. Your frame, your shutter speed, all those things are really talking to the camera, but a lot of your color stuff is actually not. And so um, one of the things to do there is to um, play with that. We use that every single day for remote participants. So when remote participants come in and they go in there and their, their, their webcam color is a little off or whatever, we go in and tweak it. You know, we can, we can play with the black levels. We can tweak them. So we, we can actually tweak all their individual inputs um, in the ATEM because a, a lot of those controls are actually available to any signal coming into the system. So um, it's a good question. And uh, the best way, I can't remember what, I couldn't make a list of what they all are, but I know that like black levels and a bunch of the gain settings and so on and so forth are not actually, you know, something that they're, that's adjusting in the camera. It's just, it's a color, it's a color control that the ATEM is doing that will affect every camera. Um, but it's not, you don't have enough power to really shade them in the same way, like exposure and things like that, but you have enough to definitely make some minor adjustments to your camera inputs. and. If you're doing things like remote, like the kind of what we do, virtual events, you can adjust them there as well. And since no one else is raising their hand, we'll go to the next question. Laurel's back with a second question. Participant in a Zoom meeting yesterday, every time I was moved into a breakout room and back into the main session, I had to turn original sound on again. Is there a setting on the host or participant side to lock it on or off? I don't think so. I think you have to set it every time. Yeah, go ahead, Greg. Yeah, I, I think because original sound is an option, I think it, yeah. it, any change of state in the Zoom, it resets. And a lot of, and, and something we've discussed here is we used to say everybody should be on original sound all the time. Now we only do it if they have a good audio system. You know, original sound is like with great power comes great responsibility. And we notice that a lot of people get a lot of noise and a lot of other things when they're in a system that, that can't handle that. Go ahead, Victor. I think it's because it, depending who owns the room, they're the ones that are allowing you to even have the original sound button. So if they have not checked that, uh, that's probably no, it's, why. It, no, it's okay. it, because because the thing is, if, if you could tur turn it on any time in the media, it means that they've already okayed it in the web settings. True. True. So it's so it it uh, but um, and then there's a lot more tools now that you can turn on that can cause a lot of damage, which is like take out all the echo control, take out all the, all the other things are you know can uh, if, you got to be really careful to make sure you have a system that's ready for that. Go ahead, Jeff. Next to the turn on original sound button, there's a pop-up that you can set to always use original sound for a particular input. And I wonder if checking that Where's for your that? input. Right next to the turn on original sound button, there's a little triangle. Select a microphone to always use original sound. And you get a choice of your audio inputs. Whoa, so I yeah. was, that's cool. Yeah, once you check Very that, nice. every time you come into a meeting, right it, original now. sound is on for that input. That's a great tip, thank you. That's good. That's that's amazing. Next question. Uh, Laura, um, Victor from the panel is in with, how do I adapt footage shot in 4K and zoom into it for a 1080 by 1920 TikTok vertical video? When I try to do it, it just looks awful. And if I move side to side, I go off frame. Um, yeah, so you want to put your, you're going to build the, are you, Victor, are you building a, a 9 by 16 video? I mean, project in, in Final Cut? Final Cut Adventure, yes, I'm doing that. But the footage, it was shot in either 4K or 1080. Um, and then, of course, 
when I try to scale that up, you know, then if I'm, you know, doing my grooving thing, I go right off the frame. And uh, is there a way to for it to track me and follow me so that I stay in frame? I, I don't know. Yeah, go ahead, go ahead, Bill. Well, I was going to say, yeah, there is newly in in Final Cut 10 a s- establish when you're going to vertical video that it will f- reframe for the starting piece of a new scene, but that doesn't track. That's a different function. I would also say be careful if you're saying it doesn't look good. Uh, Final Cut 10 uses a thing where it tries to let you get to work as fast as is humanly possible, and in doing that, it throws footage in there, and it sometimes hasn't rendered them out to their full resolution in the background. So it's common for people to work on it for a while and then come back to it later and go, everything looks much better. That's just how it works. Yeah, no, it's not the rendering. Uh, When I say it doesn't look good, it's it's. I I think maybe I need to zoom back more and do a wider angle uh, because it's just you know I'm like right here when it when it comes to the vertical. Yeah, framing for vertical and in wide simultaneously is just always a challenge. The the one of the things to think about though is that that is part of the the advantage of vertical. You know, one of the reasons people go to vertical after doing a lot of production in it is that it means you don't have to worry about the background. So that reduces the impact on, on, so you'll notice a lot of people are really close to their camera on TikTok, And it's because part of the thing is they don't have to worry about their set, you know, because there's a lot less to see other than them, you know? And so that is part of why people like to use it. And it actually, I think on a first person talking directly to their audience, the nine by 16 actually works better than, than 16 by nine, because you're not being distracted by anything else. You're just seeing what there is to see, you know, when you're trying to shoot an interview or a, shoot a scene, it's, more compressed it's it's more difficult go ahead Stuart than Jason as a cinematographer I hate that I'm going to suggest this but Victor if it's just for TikTok turn the camera sideways maximize the resolution you use and I would in your longest angle I would never I would never recommend that <laughs> so the reason <laughs> as someone who's shot a lot of stuff once you have 4k the the once you have 4k the issue is, is that you already have the maximum resolution that TikTok can use and so when you, if you turn your camera sideways, you're now, you're ba- basically cornering yourself, you know, in that system. Whereas if you shoot 16 by nine and make sure that your head, your, your top and bottom are covered, you can now make those adjustments. The worst case scenario, you cut it right down, you do a center cut and you get what you, what you would have gotten if you had turned your camera sideways. If you, if you leave it straight up and you jump a little bit this way or that way in the frame, you can, you can make those, you can do those fixes later. So, as, I mean, I've shot a lot of nine by 16 and I know people who turn them sideways. And, and the issue is if, the, if your, if your output is, is 1920 or 1080 by 1920, if that's going to be your native output, then a 4k camera lets you just slide that, that around and a 6k camera lets you go all over the place, which is what I, what I use for it. Jason. I believe it was 15 years ago, um, Mr. Alex 4D in his sunglasses wrote an article that ta- that turned me on to Track X um, from way back when. I don't even know if it's supported anymore, but that was the first time I'd ever dealt with tracking in, in Final Cut, and it was spectacular. Since then, I've moved on, and the name is escaping me, but Cormelt does it very well, or did it very well. Yeah, go ahead. Jeffrey and then Sky. Or, no, I'm sorry, Jeffrey and then Greg. And then we're gonna move yeah, on. I, we're gonna I actually, we're run out of time. I actually I actually did this uh, last night on the drums, and I and I've been playing with different cameras that will uh will work with the ATM <clears throat> Mini to uh to bring it bring it in and actually make it uh, look good. And the biggest thing is just that digital that digital feel as opposed to analog feel. And uh, I there's there's so many cameras that are out there. I've been uh, I, I'm going through the list to see which ones would work best. For something that you and i would do uh greg okay yeah i'm sorry to break in this is off topic uh john needs a password so alex or mickey can a you password doesn't he need a password um, is he, should, in, is he but, registered is he registered yeah he should he register, if he register if he registers um here i'm going to put it in the in the chat again in the mcconnell chat but that's the yeah. that's the url he should go to and if he's registered, there should be no password. Uh, he, he may need to, he, he does, from a security perspective, he needs to be able, he needs to be logged into Zoom. You can't enter this if, if you're not logged into Zoom. So he has to log in in his web. First, he has to log into the web browser into Zoom and have okay. an account. And then he needs to register. And then, he, and then he should just come right in. But there's no password. Okay. It's just, but, but the password that it's asking for is probably that he needs to have his Zoom. He needs to have a zoom identity so he needs to register to zoom 
Okay. Like, so yeah, he, as he long has, as he, he, has a, he clicks on the link that's in the email, he should be brought in. Uh, yeah. Okay. If, Who's, somebody send him the email? Well, he yeah, the email, if he registered yesterday, he should have gotten an email from us this that's morning. That's right, right. Okay, let me, if he clicks let me on if he clicks on that link, he should be able to get in. Let me debug this. Thank okay, you. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Um, I, I want to show what I think is the first use of vertical video that I, I happen to have that, that, that is that, that was caught in the wild. Um, just just as a as a really quick one here. This is uh, patient zero. This is patient zero. Exactly. Um, it shows it as a weird. Let's see. Let me see. If, do you see that? There it is a little vertical video. So that that was us shooting in in 2000. So that would have been 2000 in Zimbabwe, and a person that I had brought Mark Mark I brought him to help uh, with this, and he um, he was getting a great frame vertically, and I was like, he's like, this is amazing, and I said, and how are we going to turn the TV sideways? <laughs> Like, you know, like, how are we going to do that? He's like, oh, shut up. And then he, he, we went back to it. But but we think that that's the first vertical video that that, that we know of that was shot, um, you know, in, in modern era. Uh, go, go ahead, Sky. Well, also to your point of using that camera sideways, wax pencil on your on your frame or mm -hmm. or tape. That way you can stay. Centered. Yeah, we tape. We okay. tape off frames. We tape off frames a lot on your and... on your on your monitoring. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Copy that. Go ahead, Mickey. Pencil. Wax pencil. Go ahead, Mickey, and then we'll go on. Yeah, Victor. Um, a lot of times for for going from the typical landscape to a vertical uh output, uh, a lot of times um the video is keyframed so that the you you or whoever the the presenter is or whoever the talent is stays in in frame. Uh, so as you move around, you 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 move the keyframe of the position of the video within your canvas size. Um, <clears throat> for your situation where in all your cameras are locked off, it would, would work better if your background is more simple and plain so that it's not that, uh, it's that not as noticeable that you are keyframing the placement of, of the video. Mm -hmm. And also, I don't know if it's possible on your cameras, but some on some cameras you can set up a custom uh frame guide so you can all you can do a 9 by 16 frame guide to make sure that you are safe for both relatively safe for both 16 by 9 and 9 by 16. and and the thing about tracking by the way is just that it, it oftentimes will be a lot jittier jitter, more jittery and more and faster than you want it to be I, you know just doing it by hand if you look at the stuff i did if you look at the youtube version of the mcdubbies with my kids and then the TikTok version You'll notice that I I keyframed all of that to make it just the way I want it, um, you know. For that, go ahead, Victor. I think I just quickly come to the conclusion that I'm going to have to do purpose built uh, TikTok videos. In other words, I'm not going to be able to repurpose my jam videos and stuff. I'm going to have to just say this is for this and uh, keep it. Simple. Maybe, maybe <laughs> if you're shooting in 4K, I don't think I don't. I think it can be done. It's just it's a little bit more work. You just have to keyframe that stuff softly. Um, next question. Ruben Marchina of Grand Rapids says. Um, how do I do it and what equipment do I need to fix the delay from my live feed and the church sound from the main area? The live feed is in a second room. Yeah, go ahead, Mickey. Yeah, for something like this, typically uh, a comb either your front of house engineer or your um, systems engineer, um, if you have one for, for the church road, take care of this. Uh, they can do the delays on their board if they ha have a board that has this capability, or they can do that in the system processor if your your speaker system has a processor. Um, but typically uh, it's handled by the by the systems engineer on, yep. on more complicated set setups. Doing the math, like a very, very, very rough um, uh, way to get the amount of delay that you need to dial in is uh, a millisecond per foot, but that's super rough. Um, yeah, that's pretty much it from my Great, Jeff. I asked for for more info on this in the chat, but I didn't uh, see any. I wonder if what they're doing is calling up the uh, their live stream on YouTube in the second room, and so it's you know twelve seconds behind. Yeah, and that's maybe what they're seeing, and there's really no way around that. Yeah, I mean, getting a feed directly from the 
the venue is the is the way to do that. And one way that you can do that is something like a tear deck. Um, you can do it with a copper cable, <laughs> you know, like that that gets you from one side to the other. Uh, you can do multicast or, or you know, there's a bunch of different ways that you can handle that. Um, the easiest way to do it is with copper or fiber or something, you know, that is going to spit out what you have, what you were sending out in your live stream into that room. Um, the, the only place to worry about that is really if you can hear the other room. Like we do a lot of conferences and the overflow rooms that we have as they get the first, the ones that are right near it, where you might hear the bass or you might hear something, we make sure that those all have fiber. As soon as we get past that, we just let them pick up the stream. If they're 20 seconds behind, it doesn't matter, you know, or 15 seconds or 20, you know, 10, 10 seconds behind. It's, it's, if they can hear the interaction is the, is the real, real challenge there. All right. Next question. Our own Jeff Francis says on a single YouTube channel, is it possible to have two concurrent live streams? And then he teases our own Jason mercilessly by adding one word answer, please. Yes, J Jason. He didn't even give a J Jason didn't even give a one word answer. He just gives you a thumbs up. Yeah, the, you can do as many live streams on on, on a single channel as you'd like, uh, as, as you as you can encode. Um, for instance, when we do multi language, we do six. Uh, six channel, you know, typically a UN six will do six streams at the same time, each one with a different language. Um, and used to be with multi with the old YouTube, you'd be able to put little flags in and there'd be multiple, you know, it all be in one event during the during the piece. Um, the way that YouTube works is that you have an ingest point. And that ingest point is can be set to a you can have the same ingest point, you know, for as many events as that you'd like, or you can have different ingest points for each one, you can build custom ingest points for those. And so, um, but you can absolutely have six, 12, 18 different streams going on all at the same time. You just have to decide, are they the same or are they different and have enough encoders to get to them? Go ahead, Stuart, and then Jason. Is YouTube still having issues with multi-camera uh, streams? Uh, I know a couple of uh, the space channels and uh, rocket launch channels, they were, you were no longer able to switch between cameras at the viewer's end. Right, they took that away. YouTube took that away. Um, it used to have, and Jeff, what are you trying to do specifically? Two different venues to the same channel. So it's two, two concert oh, events. I'm sorry. So you want, you want two things to go to the same channel or the same event? Same channel, different oh, events. Yeah, that's, that's easy. Yeah, I mean, that's not, that's, you can have those both going on at the same time. That's just, they all, they just set up a different ingest point for each one of them. So a custom ingest point for this one, I would name it, you know, location a and do the other one is location b and then you just have two different encoders and they're pushing into it but the same channel can support as many live as you have encoders to to send to it so that's not a problem the more complicated question is can you send two different locations and then in series go to two different you know from venue one to venue two um and the best way to do that is to stream from one venue to the other and then have that one as the main out you know, so that you're, you have a switcher basically, or you can do it at like vMix in the cloud or OBS in the cloud where they're both streaming to that, like SRT. And then, then you switch in the cloud to do that. Um, we have master control. So we have them all sent into one place and we just switch between them. Um, and then the, the, the YouTube won't quit automatically. So you can put up a coming soon slide and then immediately turn one on and turn the other one off and do what we call a rock and roll. And you can, it'll, it'll, people will see a little uh, cycle for about 20 seconds and then it'll be, they'll be in the new location. And if the slide's the same, they'll just think it with their internet. So it's, it's a, you know, that's the, uh, the, the low cost version. Anyway, let's go to the next question. Alton Christensen says, I need to lock exposure and so forth on a 2019 MacBook Pro built-in webcam. The webcam settings app has been suggested. It's poorly rated and I understand not compatible with MacBooks with the T2 chip, though I haven't found any reviews or comments that it won't work. Please advise or suggest an alternative. Note that it is not compatible with MacBooks. That's what it Go ahead. Uh, we, we talked about this before the show. Go ahead, Jason. You can make, make it quick. Um, this is ludicrous overkill, but one easy way to do it is with OBS. To pass it through OBS and do something. But yeah, there's no there's no webcam um, setting that currently uh, works with the internal um, with with the internal process. So you, you'd have to go to uh, an external camera to have real control over the webcam because of the T2. Next question. Roger Miles, Lake Zurich, Illinois says, does anyone have an update on the status of using Echo Show as a Zoom client? What is Echo Show again? It's Sorry. the, that, that it's my, the my A my word with question. a camera. Yeah, it's the one with the screen built in, a little 
seven inch jobby yeah haven't uh, haven't used it uh okay next question vincent alvarez in bellingham co-worker played with an advanced settings in zoom now has a short sound that plays on his side only every time he turns mute on and off can't find where to turn it off sounds like a windows feedback sound but he swears it was adjusted in zoom not windows um that it oh mute on and off oh i don't know hey go ahead jason yeah, it's in web settings. Um, so it may have been client side at one point, but if you actually drill into your account, there is something that says, um, you know, play a sound when anybody unmutes. And I, for the life of me, I do not remember exactly where it is. Got it. Okay. Um, there it is. It's in the, it's in the advanced settings in, in the web settings. I thought it was advanced settings in the audio settings inside of Zoom. All right, next question. Uh, Gregory Wheeler, can the Blackmagic Design ATEM Mini Pro split the video out to two separate monitors? Not from the Mini. Uh, so the, the you would have to split it downstream from the Mini. So you'd have to take something out and then split it in some kind of HDMI splitter. And unfortunately, not a lot of good ones. <laughs> you know, so you either spend a little bit of money and you hope it works, or you spend a lot of money and it, and it will work, but it just costs, it's expensive. Um, next question. Stuart Fairweather. Oh, go ahead, go ahead, Go ahead, Jason. Did you want to add anything? Um, just well, you can always split with a splitter. I would just say um, O R E I is uh, pretty decent. There we go. Okay, Stuart Fairweather from uh, on the panel here. Question for the editor colorist on the panel: Does anyone have a resolve workflow for doing black frame noise reduction, also occasionally called dark frame noise reduction? Um, Sky. Black Magic, I mean, Resolve has a very good color uh, ability. Let me get back to you on that, but it'll it'll do some nice uh, softening. I'll get back. I'll get back. Stuart, can you describe what you're trying to do? Okay, the technique is more commonly known from astrophotography, but I believe it's the same thing that a red camera does internally, where you record both the vision you're shooting plus a period of vision of about the same length with the lens cap in place so all you're really recording is the noise of the sensor under those conditions then you re use that as a profile to remove the noise from your original footage mm. yeah sounds, that sounds like, fun in, in photography it feels like over under and it the the noise reduction not on the free DaVinci Resolve, but on the what, what, 299 or what came with your camera, it's pretty awesome. The noise reduction that you can play, and it, it, it's not just. But you're looking for a specific. But you're looking for a specific. Uh, using that, it's really interesting. Yeah, it's really good at removing things like the, that that... Um, uh, what, the fixed pattern noise that the 4K sensor that Blackmagic used to use uh, has, yeah. which, strangely that... enough, is in a certain camera from AJA. Right, right. <laughs> uh, yeah, that no, that, that I don't, I don't, I don't know. I haven't tried that, but that's a really interesting approach. But and it might work better with what you're talking about, which is the fixed noise that I am familiar with with the Black Magic cameras. Uh, when you're windowing on a 4K, uh, yeah. All right, next question. We'll Hasnick wants that. to know what Mike John from Sound Devices is using. As I mentioned before, it's a uh, Shure SM58, and the 58 is the same Utadyne 3 capsule that's in the SM7. Uh, so in the SM57, and a 58 and a 57 are absolutely identical, except for the ball drill. Uh, I know this. I worked for Shure for many years, and uh, <laughs> the, uh, you know, it's... Uh, th this specific one is a 50th anniversary 58, and for whatever reason, I've got many 58s. This has a little bit more of a high frequency rise, which is unusual because they're typically very consistent from unity. John, my phone went bad on my SM5B Fat Boy, and it's the same capsule in that, if I recall correctly. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, Fenwick and then Mickey. I think the high frequency rise might be because of the brighter color. It also would attributes to the brighter sound <laughs> yes so, yes it is so a couple of things a couple of things john uh it's the same capsule as a sm7b yeah the motor is uh, effectively the same i don't know if it's the the so identical one's 100 bucks, windings so one's ratio bucks? 
Uh, you know, I mean, a 58 is, you know, 99 US dollars in most retailers yeah. every day. Uh, and it's, you know, the same low sensitivity microphone. So it still benefits with having a, you know, a nice high gain preamplifier. Um, but yeah, the, the, the basic engine is the same. And I think what's really different is going to be the mechanical housing. And, right. you know, that certainly impacts and the how much you spend signature mic of the clip. microphone. Um, and yeah, then I mean, the last just... question, I'm assuming, are you using some noise assist to talk to us? I am. I've got about 5 dB, but fortunately oh, today the room is is quite quiet. And that was the number I was going to ask you, 5 dB. The, um, it, it is cutting back a little bit of the uh, inherent reverberation in this room. So it uh, it does take take control of that just a little bit too. Can, yeah, can, can, can you love... take out uh, air conditioning noise and, and refrigerator hum? It's, it's quite effective and the better your signal, the higher your signal is and you're, you're closer to subject to microphone distance, the better you're able to reduce some of those, uh, those noise sources. So you can get more aggressive with noise assist when you've got a better signal. If you're way off axis and your subject to microphone distance is you know, kind of in the far field and you're beyond critical distance, then noise assist is gonna start to chop up the audio potentially if you get really aggressive on it but just dialing in a little bit is really keeps things nice and tight and in control so you're this guy you're a foot and a half away from your mic is that optimal i'm about uh seven inches here so you know probably about uh you know seven times the distance of somebody typically using a 58 in a rock and roll setting and and as i said i i uh uh we bought a bunch of mix pre's with noise assist uh, in the last uh, last month or so, and we had one that the, there was this huge fan, and we were like, "What is going on?" And he goes, "Oh, I didn't, I, I didn't." He switched, he switched from the you know the, the one mic to the mix pre, and it was like there was a huge. I mean, it was like a the uh, uh, laptop fan going full tilt, and it was just gone. And we had them all yeah. set, I think, to negative five or negative four or something like that. And it was just it was just disappeared. It was amazing. So, so Sky, you know I have an AC vent right over my head right here. And uh, my mix pre kills it. Yeah. Last question uh, before we go, before we change, change subjects. Go Last question. question. Jason Fitzgerald of New York City says, multiple wireless cameras with Teradek bolts for a live concert into an ATEM with stream deck. Is there a, way, a useful way to record the line cut actions, the cuts and fades, and import into a premier multicam sequence to recreate the line cut with ISO footage? Hope to avoid manually recutting the entire concert. Go ahead, Jason. You have just described exactly the ATEM Mini ISO. I'm aware of no other way to do this for for what it costs. Of course, you could run HyperDex, um, but that won't give you the cut. So no, long story short, no. The downside is it's not going to go easily into Premiere. There's going to be some song and dance there. You're going to go through to get the ED, EDL. I think you, have, you need to go into DaVinci and then export the EDL and then bring it into you. So you'll need, you'll need Resolve to to um, make that conversion if you're committed to doing it in Premiere, or if you're just doing multicams, you can just do it in Resolve. <laughs> so, I mean, you know, like, I, you know, you may not be, you may, I think you probably find that you, it, it will be easier on a day-to-day -day basis just to learn how to use Resolve and do those multicams in there. Um, it's a pretty good app. I, I think that um, I'm, I've uh, been ramping up fast because of some of the stuff that I'm doing right now. And, um, you know, I still don't, I still would edit larger shows in Final Cut, but you know, for, for me, because I'm very comfortable with it, but Resolve is an amazing app. Like that, that would, if I'm not using Final Cut, I'm pretty much using Resolve at this point. Go ahead, uh, Alex Golner. Um, your sync is perfect. Sorry, I was actually in another app doing the search for the thing. The uh, Apollo's uh, Convergent Design uh, is a kind of multi-cam recorder that will actually export Final Cut XML and then using a converter in Final Cut or something oh, else, yeah. you can convert that to Premiere. Um, so they'll actually do re record to hard drive and all the XML required. So conversion design, Apollo. We may have we may have gotten too early on on their product because uh, we just had a lot of crashing. <laughs> so we, it was like this is great, and then it was like we're never going to use this again. So, but it, it could have been early for earlier firmware. But it was uh, we had a, we left a lot of skin on the pavement on that one. So um, that's the only thing I would just test it test heavily before you uh, you know execute it and put it into uh, into real real work. 
Uh, okay, so um, we made it, got the got the questions done. Now we're going to shift gears uh, yet again um, to uh, to our eight o'clock. And I'd like to um, like to welcome John Roche. Uh, we're really excited to uh, to have him. Hi, John. How you doing? Good morning. It's uh, John Resch, actually. So you're Resch. close. I'm, I, yeah. pol I apologize, John Resch. Uh, uh, the first time I've, yeah, I've I've seen it, just haven't heard it. But uh, it's good to have you here. Um, thank you. It's going to be here. In fact, I've got everything from radish to roach, so don't worry. Um, it's all good. <laughs> and uh, I'm certainly here to, of course, chat with you all. And, of course, uh, Greg Curta, who's a big component in my life. So that's uh, he said, hey, why don't you come on? And so here I am. And uh, good now, morning. You have been doing and, and you have been doing Foley for 40 years. Is that is that right? Yeah, over 40 years. So my gray hair gives that away. It's true. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> that is amazing. And and how and, and so and for everyone watching, uh, so we're uh, we're going to be talking talking to John here for the next hour. If you have questions as he's talking about Foley, about sound, about all the things that he's talking about, as we get started, throw them into the into Makana, ask those questions, and then we'll be jumping to your questions after the first couple minutes. Um, so so John, how did you how did you get started? How did this all happen? Well, uh, in high school, I was one of those kids who was uh, unseen. And I happened to be walking down the hallway and I looked over and saw this guy and he looked like something out of Falstaff in uh, Shakespeare play. And uh, he said, come on in here. So I walk in, this is again in high school. And he goes, well, nice to meet you. What's your name? And I said, my name is John Resch. He goes, well, I'm Brian Morgan. I'm the new theater arts teacher. And you know what? We need to, we need people for this class. So uh, what are you doing on period for whatever it was, I forget. And uh, so I signed up for the class and uh, I said to him, well, you know, look, in my my way back then, which was not really expressing myself at all, I said, well, I kind of, maybe I could run the lights or do something. Great, okay. So class starts, all their names are up on the board. And, oh, this is great. Uh, John Rush, that's me. And, and it said, uh, Vinny. I'm thinking, what is Vinny? I, what kind of light is that? And he announces, well, okay, these are the characters that could be playing in the film, in the play called Odd Couple. And uh, yeah, John Rush, you're Vinny. So I'm thinking, what? I have to be an actor? Scared the you know what out of me. But that started the journey then to where I, because I knew early on I wasn't going to be a CPA or, you know, anything like that. Or, you know, had I been charged in the moon project, they'd still be going out into, you know, the Oort cloud. So <laughs> uh, I, uh, and by the way, if I, if I talk too long, you can always interrupt me. Um, so from that, uh, I was an actor and I then applied to a couple of places, the School of Performing Arts in San Diego, California part of USIU program. The USIU is, uh, if you were John Bircher, it was a great place to send your kid, except for the School of Performing Arts, um, to where uh, they were the black sheep, and they mounted about 48 productions a year. That's amazing. Now, mind you, a lot of them were like one-act plays, theater in the round, et cetera. But it was great. I met some guys there. We made a film. We won the film festival in 1972, San Diego. I springboarded there to uh, New York University, made a film there, springboarded to AFI, and then I my uh, come to you know who moment happened where I just didn't love it enough to be a director. I just it just just didn't work. It's so a lot I of was hard doing, work. like it's, uh, it's... It, yeah, it, <laughs> you gotta, it just didn't you gotta work. Really love it, yeah. right? So so bottom line on that is I, you know, I just did AD work. I did all sorts of work, and I got a call from a gal who was my script supervisor, my one of my AFI films. She says, "Hey, look, I need help on sound." Okay, I can help you on sound. I don't know anything about it, but I can help you on sound. And uh, yeah, breaking. This is back in analog days, so I'm breaking down reels and things. And uh, they look around and go, "Okay, you've got sneakers on, right? Are you a runner?" Said, yeah. Okay, good. Uh, come with us to the Foley stage. Now, of course, Foley stage for those who have not seen one is uh, think of a movie theater. It's not necessarily raked per se. All the seats are out, and there's a lot of surfaces on the ground. So, like maybe one area's got grit, gravel. Another area's got dirt. Another area's got uh, uh, tile. Another one's got wood. Anyway, I walk in this room and think, "This is bizarre." And they said, okay, now see that guy on the screen there, it's running. Uh, when you see the red light, don't say anything, just run, kind of try to run, you know, for him in sync. Okay, so this all starts up and I start running, but I run across the room, <laughs> not realizing, of course, you have to run in place, so to speak. It's almost like marching in place in a sense. So, <clears throat> so I did that and I uh, went home and I thought, that is the stupidest job I've ever seen and heard of in my life. Well, wouldn't you know it, I got a phone call, no kidding, that night from her husband, said, you know, we really like what you did. I'm doing something tomorrow, and could you please um, come and help out? I said, sure. So I'm leaving 
you know, my apartment building in Venice, California. And this woman walked by, I almost hit her. It was my convertible car is backing out. And I said, oh, Joan, gosh, I'm sorry. I didn't mean, I didn't see you there. She goes, oh, that's okay, Johnny. Where are you going? I said, I'm going to the Foley stage. She's not going to know what that means. She goes, really? That's what I do. I'm like, what? Yeah, in fact, they just fired somebody. I'm working. Maybe they'll hire you. That was on a Tuesday. I got hired on the Friday, and I've been doing it ever since. <laughs> that's hilarious. Yep. But that's how it happens. You know, like just saying yes to something and just showing up. You know, like, I, I, I do believe, I, I don't know who actually coined the term, but, you know, they, they say 90% of it is just showing up. You know, it's just, just, just being there when someone asks and, and, uh, and jumping into it is, it's, it's amazing. Um, now, do you, we, Sky had a question. Uh, do you, uh, what is, where did the name Foley come from? Do you? Oh, absolutely. Uh, it came from a guy named Jack Foley, who came up with the idea of, because previous to that, um, all footsteps were cut from a library, if they were even put in at all. And uh, Jack was a, a true Renaissance man. I mean, pe when people think of Foley, you know, we hear Foley and Jack Foley associated, and that's kind of what he is noted for. He was a, a director, assistant director, writer, uh, producer. He actually created a, uh, a place uh, where ca uh, Westerns were shot. Uh, he just, he was really kind of an amazing guy. And it turns out that a, a picture uh, needed some help. And well, but he just decided, look, I think I can make some sound effects with my hands or my feet better than cutting these, these things. And so they actually tried a system where they actually uh, put it on acetate disc. In other words, they were recording to acetate disc. And then they worked off of there. Uh, it was never called Foley until uh, somewhere in the 60s, maybe late 60s. It was always called the sync stage or the A stage or things like that. But in deference to Jack Foley, once he passed, it just somehow kind of got in, the lexicon got in there and now we call it the Foley stage. That's great. And, and what is your, what is a Foley artist? How do you prepare for me for, for doing um, a, a given scene? How much time um, do you get? Like how well, when do you see the scene? Do you see it in real time? Do you see it a couple of days before? What, what, what does it look like? Well, I'm going to give you a, a brief overview because I think it's going to help uh, answer the question. Sure. Uh, in my era, typically a Foley uh, team is, is a full, two Foley people, Foley artists, uh, Currently, it's myself uh, and my partner, um, uh, Shelly Roden, and then there's Scott Curtis, the mixer. So what we will do is, right, what are we going to do for a show X coming up? Well, hopefully, we'll get a chance to look at that with the uh, supervising sound editor and or the Foley editor, et cetera, and get a sense of what's what's going on in this film. Is it a is it an organic film? It's in a courthouse. You know, it's uh, very dramatic, and the wood floor is creaking. You, and, 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 what do you, and what do you mean by an organic film? Just that it's uh, <clears throat> all these sounds are coming are, are realistically based. They're they're very rich in in hue, and uh, we want to uh, be connected to the surface, connected to what's 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 happening on screen, versus something let's say let's a Schwarzenegger would be in, which we call the OTT over the top. So maybe he has a bow and he's you know pulling the <clears throat> bowstring back to you know shoot somebody. It's got to sound like the world's largest bow. Um, so. So specifically to prepare, prepare for, uh, let's say we're starting day one on, again, show X. Well, we will come in, Shelly and I and Scott, and uh, we will look at the reel. And then we will kind of in our minds go, okay, this character's wearing this shoe, this character's wearing that shoe. We tend to, Shelly and I, because we're working together, gravitate to certain things, not only footstep wise, but prop wise. And really then try, how can we tell the, the story from that perspective uh, sonically? of footsteps and of props. And that's the key to good Foley, or should I say excellent Foley, is really having a, a bit of the thespian actor in it versus just clip clop, clip clop. But you have something that's dynamic, psychoacoustically, you feel like the character's coming from the background, coming right up to the foreground, you know, or the and the and the one character who's, you know, let's say the, the Nazi, you know, his boots are creaking, you know, and they're big and, you know, feel threatened, et cetera. And, and, and like, how closely do you match the, the shoes? Like, like, well, if you see someone has a certain kind of shoes, like, are you trying to find that brand or just that, or do you have like a, a, a series of boxes? It's this kind, it's a runner shoe. It's a office shoe, that type of thing. Well, we, what we'll try to do, yeah, visual reference. We'll try to, then if we have something in our, 
and our wares that we can utilize to do that, we will. But that might or might not work. Um, and typically, well, I have probably about 95 pair of shoes. I think Shelly has 100 and something. Um, and yes, I do have high heels, folks. It's true. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so, but, uh, but what we'll end up doing then, Alex, to answer the question directly is we will do whatever we can to where what we do fits in with the production in a way that you don't know we've done it. So in other words, the rule of Foley is if we've done our job correctly, you don't know we've done it. Right. No, it's, that's so much of effects. You know, I worked in visual effects for a long time and so much of effects is if you noticed it or you say that's a great effect, then we didn't, we didn't get it quite, you know, quite there. Uh, Kev Brewer asks, um, what's been the most challenging piece of Foley that you've had to create? <clears throat> I can't say there's really one per se. I would say, uh, you know, there's genres, as we know, you know, live action, uh, video games, et cetera. In live action, probably the most difficult one uh, was a, a trial <laughs> was The Abyss. Uh, of course, that's a James Cameron film. Right there, you don't want to, uh, you know, disappoint James. James, and, James has uh, a strong reputation of, uh, right, of, but, of but, being very uh, outspoken during production. He, he does, I, I guess. I mean, again, my experience with him was terrific. Now, I think I, I was lucky. The other, I could hear him through the walls. I didn't, I didn't work with him, but I was on another production. <laughs> I, could, I could hear him on the other, other side of the wall uh, well, he, yelling at somebody. Yeah, he came uh, actually for playback, and we'd done the for about three days worth of work. And we didn't start, and typically we like to start in the beginning of a picture and work through chronologically. Couldn't happen with this one because of what was going on editorially. So we started with some of the underwater work first, which water is extremely difficult for Foley. And um, I was a little nervous. And, what makes it hard? What makes water uh, hard? <laughs> It's uh, it soaks up soaks up so many pardon the pun, um, just frequencies that to, to get somebody to read correctly or you know what does a, a swimmer sound like going underwater with a swimming bot, you know how, and the how problem do you is that it's the size of the the size of the of the uh, you know what you sound like in the ocean versus a pool versus the uh, bathtub is completely different, right? Uh, you you'd think so that but okay. that honestly has nothing to do with anything, and the reason why I say that is it's it's more the uh, the techniques that you're utilizing, because we'll use we'll use techniques where we might use some surface water, underwater water, if you will, and then completely out of the water tank. So what's called doing effects, uh, underwater effects out of the tank. Those items combined will give us what we need. So let's say we have a scuba diver swimming left to right, foreground, okay, and it's a close up. So we see their mask, then we see their body, then we see their fins go away. Um, so one channel will be an underwater channel of just water movement, if you will, literally water movement. Um, and we might do that with, with the mic, uh, uh, not in, under the water, but above the water, but of course, uh, frequency wise done a certain way. Then we might take, um, uh, some of the elements that are on the diver, you know, uh, a scabbard or things that are moving around, et cetera. Uh, we would do this maybe, you know, underwater EQ out of the tank. Uh, and then uh, if we're not, if it needs more drama, I might take an underwater PZM and put some water on it from a hose. So, you know, I mean, again, there's just many, many methodologies one can employ to, because the beauty of Foley is, uh, yeah, it's called Foley, but actually what it is, is, is custom sound effects. You're creating right. something for, in that particular moment, that particular picture. There you have it. <laughs> Fen Fenwick. I got to say, I think the sound in the abyss was perfect. <laughs> you buried the lead. You should have said, hi, I did the sound in the abyss. What do you what, what question do you want to ask me? Um, also, <laughs> I think the scene where Lieutenant Coffee is clicking that winch in the dive pool. Yes, the chain. Yes. Is it, that's the sound in the abyss is perfect i don't know what it sounds like to be stuck at the bottom of the ocean but i believe i believed every bit of it awesome. well chris I, chris my lead could have been i worked on disco godfather that was one of my big no, pictures early on but <laughs> but but uh interesting to note because alex had asked too like shoes did you get that we actually i went out and bought a particular um device that the chain literally matched what you heard in production so no. 
that's and that's such what, a it, creepy scene when he's going <laughs> that's, that's what is awesome. the what what is the most surprising thing that you use for sound that doesn't relate at all to what you see? So you see something, but what you're using to reproduce that is something completely different. What would you say is the one that would surprise most people? Um, for me, it's a it's an old orange cushion off of a sofa. Now, what does that mean? Well, recently oh, I worked oh, on, on a film. <laughs> recently I worked on a film that uh, I have the cushion down on the cement and uh, we, our microphones are on tripods. They're not on wheels. And I put the uh, orange cushion uh, on top of one of the tripod pieces, if you will. So it was covering, you know, here's, here's the tripod. It was covering it this way. Then I had some sand on top of that. Then I had some quarter inch tape on top of that. And I made some swirling wind effect with that. So that's, but really, honestly, Alex, to pick out one particular thing, <clears throat> I, there's, uh, yeah. it's all, you know, all of them are, it's, 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 it's a palette. It really, it's a palette. Like, you know, I'm watching any, uh, you know, decent, uh, person that's, you know, painting a picture, a painter, it's a palette. Uh, uh, Scotius says, uh, wondering about ear, uh, eye ear lag, does it exist? Do audio cues always land exactly with the visual or is there standard offset in either way? Are you saying in, in Foley performing or editorially speaking? Or just when you're thinking about it. Yeah, when you're thinking about that sound, do you think about that as far as when, like that the audio yeah. comes first or the video comes first? No, I can answer that. Um, we're, uh, we're real time uh, people. <laughs> that is, in fact, I'm an audile. If I uh, see something MOS without sound, I hear it in my mind. And in fact, that's how I Foley. I will imagine in my mind what that sound should be for that particular thing I'm looking at and then try to create it with my hands, feet, or you know, teeth, <laughs> forehead, whatever. Right. So, <laughs> Yeah, absolutely. Sky and then Mickey? Well, to that point, you say what that sound should be versus what it maybe is. And I was kind of curious, do you ever go on set? The Abyss reminded me, didn't they shoot that like in an abandoned... Uh, atomic cooling plant or something like that and and because as the audience ingests a sound it may be completely different on the location so i'm just curious yeah i think Shai, there's a two parts to that um okay there's a picture called the green mile and that film uh, all the stars were in alignment how uh the set was a hot set of the facility i was working at because Tom Hanks had to go off and do something else. The director, a really great guy, loved the sound of the actual Green Mile, the set they created. And again, it was wood, you know, standing in for Lino, et cetera. But, but it had this really interesting sound. So we actually created tie lines in a monitor. So we went over to the set. And at that time, Mary Jo Lang was the mixer work with me. And... Um, we would Foley on the set. And the really interesting thing about that is we could Foley in three dimensions per se. So if it's walking down the green mile from, you know, way back, walking up into a close up, exactly. We'd start way back and walk up to the monitor. Um, and so, so our, our starting point, I'm sorry, I'm going to pull this down so I don't blind everybody's. Uh, okay. Uh, the starting point is what's in production and do we need to match that? Uh, you know, of course, if it's a, if it's a film with uh, visual effects or again, the director says, I hate the green mile, don't match that, then we won't. And fact, and then what is it? And that's an issue that comes up a lot of times in uh, animated films, because we might get something that's not really at the point where we know what the surface is. So we'll have to like ask me like, uh, what is that? And, uh, sometimes they don't even know, <laughs> or they say, well, we think it's going to be grass. And later on you find out it was dirt. <laughs> so, but uh, anyway, hopefully that answers your question. Yeah, that's great. Uh, Mickey and then Courtney. Uh, yeah, I was go just going to say like, yeah, definitely we, we want to be, uh, we want Foley and picture to be like spot on. No, no, like making up for a distance. Well, depends on the shot, but most of the time we want to be like spot on in terms of time. And, and editorial wise, um, when I'm cutting Foley, I find like certain artists, Foley artists have like a, a, a delay or um, <clears throat> something like they tend to 
like I know like for example this Foley artist tends to be like two frames behind or like a frame ahead so <laughs> I get I get to learn how Foley artists react react to the picture and how they perform it's it's sort of like with ADR as well and cutting ADR like I know this this uh, actor tends to be four frames behind and like I or, or automatically nudge it and then before before I start listening I had a sound well, designer that Oh, go ahead, go ahead, go ahead, John. Well, that's the international Foley standard, Mickey. Just, you know, two frames behind and uh, shoe size nine and a half. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I had a, you know, I had a sound designer that that talked about changing the sync based on the distance to camera, and uh, that he would change the change the delay because he said when you actually see it, the sound is coming. If if someone's you know twenty feet away or thirty feet away, the sound is actually getting there after the after the video but when they get up to you the sound is synced you know and he would play with that and i was like that is crazy i don't know if any <laughs> he's the only person i'm not going to mention him but he's the only person i ever talked to about that and i just thought it was an interesting uh, interesting approach and he would change the where the the sound was to the to the impacts based on how far away the person wow. was from the camera saying that you know that's actually what it would feel like because it's because it's taking you know the sound is, is the when you see lightning he, you know the, he, he gave lightning in seven seconds the between the time you see it and yeah exactly go ahead courtney um, a friend of mine who was a sound mixer on uh, the TV series Shogun was uh, shooting over in Japan. And tell me if you've ever heard of this being done before. Uh, it was a big wide scene, and, and in Japan they shoot a lot of multiple cameras that aren't blimped, so there's camera noise issues to deal with. And uh, it was a big wide scene, and, and he was listening at, at the sound card recording, and he was hearing the, the footsteps perfectly clearly. It was a non-dialogue scene. He couldn't figure out how he could hear it because his mics weren't anywhere near there. And he looked over, and the local Japanese boom crew that he had hired was doing live foley of their own feet in sync with the characters uh, in front of the camera in real time, <laughs> live during the production. Have you ever heard of anyone doing live production foley like that? Well, it was radio, right? Old the old radio did that all the time. Right. Good, well, John. Oh no! In the answer to that question, yes, actually, I know I've known people that have done that. Um, you know that's very unusual, but certainly that that you know that that can be done, um, yeah. <laughs> and non blimped yeah. That's fun. They used in Japan all the time because they shot with all these you know unblimped cameras, and so they can't get the mic near the actor himself, but he'd be you know uh, fifty yards away. <laughs> have, have Have you ever heard an IMAX camera running? Yes, I've heard them running. <laughs> That'll wake you right up. <laughs> yeah. Ah, oh, the wonders of, of, of now that we're moving to digital. Everything's a lot quieter. Uh, go ahead, Jeffrey. <laughs> thanks, thanks a lot. Thanks a lot for being here. Uh, I'm looking through your list, and and every movie that I look at, I start hearing the sounds that are coming from like Real Genius, you know, when that car was going up and down inside the room, or the Karate Kid, or or anything like that. Just it it it's awesome on that. My question though is, uh, I noticed that you did Back to the Future. And uh, I'm, I'm kind of wondering, is there any type of sound that you created that like 10, 20 years later, all of a sudden actually is part of the actual, like a cell phone or something like that. you hear a ringtone. It's like, hey, wait a minute, I created that 10, 20 years ago. Uh, typically not. Um, uh, I can't really think of the only weird thing that happened once was I was asked to do a cue for a film where uh, we were down south, uh, the setting was down south in the United States, and these characters were in jail. And uh, I guess as a joke, the Foley supervisor wanted me to do, um, har oh, let's see, harmonica offstage, uh, soulful. You know, so first and foremost, that's a music cue, which is not something we do. But I went along with, okay, fine. You know, so I did, and of course, my harmonica is broken because <laughs> it's a Foley prop. So I did this kind of really, oh, you know, I'm sure all the dogs were howling in the neighborhood. And uh, lo and behold, somehow it hit the dub stage and I get a phone call uh, saying, well, uh, what's the name of your, are you an ASCAP? What's the name of your publishing company? What, all this, like what? Oh yeah, it was a, it was a real nightmare. So uh, <laughs> anyway, <laughs> yeah, that's, uh, that's, it's, anyway, moving on, sorry. Oh, uh, uh, next question is from TJ uh, Asher uh, in Minneapolis. He said, since Foley is so physical, what do you do to stay in shape or is your work enough to keep you in shape? I find uh, three good gin and tonics a night. Or, no, I. Uh, <laughs> but what no, kind actually, of gin? <laughs> <laughs> oh, come on, Bombay. 
Uh, <laughs> no, I, I, yoga, at least every other day. A good bike ride, too. Um, I don't, I use, I was triathlete actually for many years, but uh, my knees aren't quite what they used to be at my tender young age. So, you know, I, it's, it, you know, eat right and, which, and then, of course, the follow on to that is eating right. You know, really, the things, some foods you don't want to eat because um, you get on the stage and your stomach's like announcing itself every five seconds. Um, so, All right. but uh, I think, I think just, just that. And of course, pre pandemic, I would try to get it, honestly, I would try to get a, a, a massage once or, or once a week or once every two weeks. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, absolutely. No, that's, that makes sense. Uh, uh, Mickey asks, shoot body falls or leave to special effects in other words uh should we not do the body falls and let them be done by by a a library or should we perform them so i'm going to assume it's we perform them and it really depends about the texture and again as i said is it an organic film uh or is it over the top you know and you know if it's if, if it's a moment where the the body falls on the wood floor and it cracks a little bit or creaks you know, it's much easier for us to, you know, do that in such a way that it fits that moment. Because again, you know, Foley is just that. It's a custom sound effect. That's, a, but, but to all those of, out there that are working on pictures and, you know, giving information to their Foley supervisors, or whatever, you know, keep in mind, just like you, it's, we're in, in it with you in the war. So uh, there may be some battles for, not to win, but let's win the war. So if you cue everything and we only have X amount of days, then something's got to give. And that's not a good thing. Not to say that if you have a film that's budget challenged, hey, you can bring it to us. People have done this. You know, they'll send me a film early on appropriately and give, ask for my feedback. They'll say, well, I think the film will take, I'm just going to say, it'll film will take 20 days. Well, we only have a budget for 15. I said, well, okay, you've got, you've got um, a scenes where you have uh, soldiers, explosions and things. You know, do you really need them uh, running around there? Are we going to hear the feet because there's uh, jets flying around? So I'm, I'll say, you know, what, not doing their job, just asking questions that impact our job. And, um, and when, I, of course, I say our job, I mean myself, Shelly, and Scott. So uh, that's where are you what, based? Uh, I'm in Northern California now. I work uh, at a, a, a up here. And uh, so I, I've, <laughs> unfortunately, I can't really talk about it cogently. I know it sounds kind of silly, but uh, uh, it's, uh, it's, a, it's a really wonderful place to work. I love the people I work with there. So oh, that's, that's uh, great. Yeah, go, go ahead, Jason. I can't help but wonder, since Back to the Future was brought up, just how much of the DeLorean is actually DeLorean. I've heard many a DeLorean, and it doesn't sound anything like that. So, and, and if it, there isn't a lot of it, where did you get that Reeve sound, that whir that is kind of so specific to um, to the time machine? Okay, so we're, this this is a great question, Jason. I'll tell you why. We're gonna we're gonna uh, split the screen, and here's me, and then right next to me is Chuck Campbell. So Chuck Campbell was the supervising sound editor on that picture, uh, and Bob Rutledge assisted him. So that sound you mentioned, that was an actual sound effect. But to answer your question underneath that how much was the actual delorean i'd say two (laughs) percent because the engine we all that stuff had nothing with delorean in fact uh anytime we touch the car sit in the car go wing opening up uh air release the go wing opening up etc even the ice cracking uh all foley that was all done by the foley in fact the ice cracking was uh old school uh ice tray you know, the, what the mom and dad used to have in the, or grandma and grandpa, you pull that. So I put that on the side, pulled the lever up. And, so that's when the going went up when it came back to the future. Cause of course it's very cold in the future. And, uh, and then I used an air supply and hose, you know, to have also assist the up, et cetera. And it was all done with a, a 1975 uh, old Ford Fairlane cab door mounted on wheels. <laughs> and right. and it was an automatic window which we put a 12 volt battery on it in fact that was used for if you remember the beginning of the picture um we come into doc's lair and uh, at least we were panning around the lair and we see the you know the dog you know robotic arm you know can open all stuff feeding the, the dog einstein again uh that was the actual window sound we recorded that and we took um 
can't remember the name of the device. I'll, I'll probably think of it before the show is over. Uh, it was a MIDI device, and we took it there, and so we were able to pitch it down a little bit. This is, this is back in the days, you know, when dinosaurs ro roamed the earth. So, <laughs> Sky. Okay, I have to ask, and you're amongst friends here, so this is just between you and me. How many of those and mouth, YouTube? How how many of those mouth sounds actually make it into the movie? You know, it, you know, I just we we all do that, even if we have the instrument in front of us. But we, so just you can tell us. Uh, I'm going to say, uh, from my standpoint, uh, probably 0.00001%. Now, there's another folks uh, who is pretty famous, and he likes to do a lot of mouth effects. And so I'm all for, hey, whatever works, whatever, you know, because we're fooling the audience, just like shooting the picture. You know, if we pull back from the camera, there's all these, you know, there's the grip, there's, you know, craft service, or at least hopefully someday by 19, by 2029. Um <laughs> You know, and, and uh, you know, so it really doesn't matter, you know, what what's done as long as you, the audience, believe it, it's it's the, it's the correct thing. So, Go ahead. Uh, Chris, I, John, I cut a lot of low end, you know, corporate stuff. And so uh, Nat sound or street effects is it's going to come from the live mic that's on the camera. And I was cutting a piece for DHL years ago and the cameraman was doing these like, you know, handheld swish pans on the street and every time he moved his camera you could hear the guy in the mic going that's right it was like oh well mute that channel hey actually chris i'm glad you said that because shy you know, that reminds me remember i said the point you know there's a point a syringe when you're sucking up um fluid in a syringe that's sometimes something I'll do with my mouth. Oh, interesting. Yeah. And and now we're talking animated feature. Okay. We will do something sometimes, but like uh, when, uh, let's see, Little Mermaid, uh, Flounder, is, or the Sebastian's going around, I'd take um, a bolt, big bowl and a straw, put it in there and do some bubbles and things that way. But, you know, not the actual, like you said. <laughs> um, is, uh, is there, Bill Davis. I'm sorry. Okay. Uh, go ahead. Go Bill Davis asks, uh, what's your process when a sound effect uh, needed, when a sound needed doesn't exist, like punching an alien blob? Again, being an auto, what am I hearing in my mind? And and what's the context? Um, is it an alien blob that's like, if you touch it, it sucks you in and you'll never get out, you'll die. So it wants to sound horrifying, you know, and, and, and incredibly powerful. Or is it like a, a, a fun alien that like, you know, your hand bounces off it for a second, you know, and it goes hee 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 or something, you know. We'll we'll get lean towards something comic, if you will, to some degree. You know, it really depends on the context. And uh, Chris had a follow-on question, I think, by the way. All right, go ahead, Chris. Oh, he didn't. Okay, oh, he I does. I think I did, and I have since <laughs> forgotten. Okay, perfect. Moving <laughs> on. I do that Jason, to people. <laughs> Jason asks. Uh, Jason Bach asks. How frequently do do you find yourself using a water phone? A, a water phone? Yeah, Give me Jason, yep. can you? Hydrophone, yeah, water, maybe? No, hydrophone? Yeah, the, yeah, sorry, a hydrophone. Oh, hydrophone, I okay. I them as water phones, yeah. Yeah, Jason, if you want to immediately overload your system, uh, you use a hydrophone. We never use a hydrophone. Hydrophones need space. And typically in a Foley stage, uh, back where I'm at currently, we have a 400-gallon uh, water tank, one of a series, which is we can actually sound like we're in the ocean. There's nothing we have to do to treat it to sound, have it sound like that. And and getting back to what Alex asked earlier on, meaning we can work in that tank and not have to have anything around us per se to fool the room into thinking we're actually outside, meaning no uh, echoes. So, but even if something like that wouldn't work, uh, that's we did try it on the abyss and got slapped down for that. Uh, you know, that is, you know, for internally, because like we listen to it, this is terrible. So uh, you do have the, oh, the, the mod where you can take a uh, prophylactic, believe it or not, and put it on ECM 50 and drop it over the side. But that's still nothing good. Underwater PZM. Yeah, Greg Curta knows about that. Which which part? Oh, no, sorry. Just kidding. <laughs> what were you going to so, say, sorry, Greg? Alex. Were you going to add something there, Greg? No, I was, I was just going to say there's, you know, there's a lot of, there's a lot of underwater miking techniques. None of them work particularly well. 
uh, probably the hydrophone least of all. <laughs> yeah. Go ahead, yeah, Courtney. but they're really fun to play with. <laughs> yeah, I record, I record the uh, underwater effects on Blue Lagoon, and what we used was a uh, an ECM fifty, like you said, and we had a about a six foot kitty vinyl wading pool, you know, to get, and, and just shoved the ECM fifty under the bottom of the pool, filled it with water, and. We recorded a lot of the underwater effects on that, plus a surface microphone as well to sweeten it up. Yeah, and, and I have a question. I have a question then for Courtney. Yeah, Courtney, I'm sorry. Did, was Desi Markowski? Was she yeah. the working with? Yes, yeah, she was the lead. Desi was the script supervisor that that uh, and her husband helped get me in the film business. Raspopov. <laughs> yes. Yeah, Desi Desi Markowski and Emil Raspopov. So. <laughs> That's great. Uh, Roscoe asks, when you have uh, when you have built a fully stage from scratch, uh, what have been your top three features? Does the location matter? Oh, location, location, location. That's the top three. Uh, then moving on from <laughs> that is, uh, uh, and I'm not punting the question. It depends upon what it's going to be utilized for. First and foremost, never, repeat never, underline, underscore, in big letters do a dual purpose stage. Oh, let's do Foley and ADR on the stage. It'll never be good, ever. I mean, it'll be good enough maybe for television or whatever, and not putting it on TV. Uh, especially these days, you know, TV's requirements are really stringent, which is great. But to answer the question directly, you would need to know who's gonna work on the stage, or if not, then really try to create it for uh, a team that knows what they're doing. So you'd have to have proper acoustics being number one. You know, and then proper pit placements and what the pits are consisting of and how they're designed too. And then a water tank area that's done correctly. And those three things happening all at once together, in my experience, have been maybe once, twice, twice. Or I'm at currently is one. Interesting. Go ahead, Chris Fenwick. You remember. Uh, I, I remember, I did. <clears throat> when it... Is there, um, first of all, what union do you have to be in to, as a Foley artist? And is there, is there a crossing of a line, a, a union line, if you actually do create a sound uh, vocally, as opposed to, you know, punching a orange sofa cushion? <laughs> okay, to answer the question, yeah, I am in a union. However, one does not necessarily need to be in the union to work in the film as or Foley, which is a bit of an oxymoron. And I'll get on my soapbox for a second and say I'm uh, of the older generation. Uh, my health care for myself and my family, in fact, uh, having my two children, the cost to me was zero, nada, bupkis. It's the greatest uh, health care plan and retirement plan that one could hope for. So if one has a chance, it's not yet, in the States, they get into the union, I highly recommend it. And they also help have your back, help have your back. So you could work union, work non-union. I'm, I'm union. Um, and then uh, it's interesting, the, the official answer is no, one does not do anything vocally because that is handled by another union. And the union, by the way, sorry, I should have said local 700, at least uh, the jurisdiction that uh, that I'm involved in. And that's based in Southern California, even though I'm up in Northern California right now. Um, and ironically though, there are times when we're asked to do certain things that kind of fall into this gray area. Uh, kissing being one, you know. So when people are smooching on camera, that's rarely if ever actual a production uh, because um, it doesn't tend to sound very good. It tends to sound just not necessarily romantic if it's a romantic scene, you know. So what we try to do is really tone it down and give it a sensitivity and a, a beauty, if you will. So, um, and I can't really think of offhand if I've been asked to do anything per se that's uh, straight out. Uh, no, not really. So hopefully that answers your question, Chris. All right. uh, Jeff Francis asks, uh, who decides if a particular sound will come from the Foley team or from cut effects? Is there ever overlap between the teams? Uh, there can be overlap, but we we hope that doesn't doesn't happen per se. Or if it does, um, let's say it's a uh, the side of a building's falling down, uh, and our characters just just miraculously, miraculously escape, uh, and they've already cut the. Hopefully, they've cut the effects for that 
not just temp effects, but maybe hopefully something that's going to be utilized for the for the actual dub. And we get that track. And they, they, they can say, well, we'd like you to help with the debris sound or they're kicking the rocks out of the way or the sand falling on them, et cetera. The, more the textures and the, the specifics versus the big all engulfing sound. And that's really comes from the supervising sound editor or sound designers, he, she, or they, either directly or more likely in our case, it'll come from a supervising Foley editor. And they will then create a session via Pro Tools and by the way, this is a, a the, your freebie of the day. It's it's most important. It's almost like if you want to get in a race car and go around the track, make sure there's enough gas in it. Make sure the queue, queuing's done correctly, right? I'll say it one more time. Make sure the queuing's done direct correctly because otherwise we are fighting like, hey, are there four gallons or five gallons in there? What the hell's going on? You know what I mean? It's just, it's crazy. So, so you have the, uh, you know, let's say uh, Sally, who's a Foley editor, uh, and she's created the cues. She will then hopefully uh, either be with sitting with us when we run the reel, or of course is available to call. And or um, if we are not sure of something, um, we might early on in the picture send some tests to the powers of B. You know, so it's Schwarzenegger running down a, a metal hallway, and we want him to sound a certain way big. They, that's what we're told. Well, we might do test A, B, C, D and send that to them and have them give us some feedback. And um, funny, most of the time, it'll be the ones we like. But every once in a while, something comes up, people go, God, we love D. And we're thinking, wow, really? Okay, cool, though. It's, that's their, their choice. And, you know, we want to honor that. These days, are you, do you have a lot of people watching remotely? Are they watching, the, the, watching you do it or giving you any feedback over some kind of remote connection? That's, that depends upon the client. And uh, it depends upon the their needs. So I, I can't answer the question directly per se, other than typically we don't. Uh, it's mm-hmm. it kind of kind of like the proofs in the in the pudding. You know, they, the the session comes back to them, and they'll typically review it, uh, and then maybe give us notes or or whatever. So so typically not, Alex. Um, Sky asks, uh, have you ever created an icon sound like the Wilhelm scream? Like anything <laughs> that people use over and over again. By the way, if the record I'm going to tell everybody right now, most of what you've heard about the Wilhelm scream, as far as if you see anything on, on, uh, you know, out there in the wild on uh, Google, et cetera, it's wrong. The actual person who knows is Ben Burt. Okay. So Ben Burt has added, I'm pretty sure Ben Burt has added the Wilhelm scream into everything he's ever done. At some well, point. I- I think you Somewhere. should get him on the. I think you should get him on the show because he, he'll you give you a good tell him how You need to tell him. I have already pinged him, and he said he he doesn't. He's not doing this right now. But but uh, <laughs> but if you if you talk to him, tell him how great it was, and tell him he should come on because I'm trying to get him on. He's he's amazing. But anyway, uh, but go ahead, go ahead. I'll, I'll 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 give it a shot. Um, okay. Uh, I don't really know that there's anything iconic per se. There there I've heard tale that there are a couple things from Back to the Future, ironically, that we did. Uh, Foley wise that were used in other places um, and some type of potential for rides. I don't even know if it ever came to fruition. I, I really don't know. It's just kind of an urban legend. So I'm going to say no, you know, as, a, as an official answer. <laughs> good, good, but, good, but, Jeffrey. but you're a young man. The, the days, the stay still young. You could, you could come up with something. <laughs> good, good, uh, Jeffrey. So I, I'm, I'm curious, is there, is there a time where you're, you've, you've created a, you've created a sound for a movie um, either the movie has come out or you're, you're, they're still in post-production. You say, I've got a better sound for that. I'd like to do this one. And that either makes it in the movie or you've uh, created a separate soundtrack for your viewing pleasure. Uh, my viewing pleasure, never. Uh, and the trains left the station, Jeffrey, uh, pretty much. Now that, that being said, if something goes to the dub stage and the director says, yeah, I really like that, but can we add this? Or, gee, I'm not sure I like that. Can we change that? Then, obviously, if we have time, they'll reach back down to us, and we'll do that. Uh, knock on wood, that's uh, probably happened maybe twice in my career. Uh, you, and not, nothing that bad. So, Who do you think are the who, – who have been, your experience, the best directors to work with when it comes to this, as far as understanding what you do and really thinking about it and keeping you in the process? Those directors that hire the best supervising sound editors, sound designers. I mean, I mean that sincerely, because they understand to delegate. They trust the people that they hire, and those people then trust the people that they hire that work with us. 
because it's all about communication. You know, because really, if Schwarzenegger's on the screen, what do we want him to sound like? You know, uh, you know, and 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 you know. Uh, now, maybe to answer the question a little more granularly, uh, David Fincher is extremely involved in the sound in every picture he does, and or even uh, he's done some things for Netflix. I guarantee you that he has heard every Foley effect naked and everything that he has worked on. Guarantee you that. Uh, now, maybe within a session, you know, not just like, okay, play this, no, but he, he knows what he has and his ear is good to where he can, and he hires Ren Kleiss. I mean, you know, it doesn't get much better than that. There's, you know, many wonderful people, but Ren and Ren being one of them. That's great. Uh, Stuart Fairweather said, uh, how much has going digital changed the art of Foley? Are there still places that analog gear does a better job? Well, the irony is, of course, Foley, by definition, how we perform it is all analog. So it's, it's from that aspect, from a artistic aspect, it's not changed anything. It has in the perception of a producer, potentially, where they think, well, wait a second. We don't need to take time to, you know, pull the picture down analog, you know, projected, go back to the top, realign all the machines, et cetera. So we have plenty of time. In fact, you have plenty of time, so you don't need more time. Well, the irony is because the digital age is here, especially the visual effects, there's so much more packed into a screen that, and that, of course, we're detail oriented. That's much so, so much more on our plate. So, so again, uh, our jobs per se, really no uh no skin off our back but but the perception that there's we can work so much faster uh within the digital realm is not true it's in fact if anything it's the opposite hence good queuing <laughs> yeah a great yeah the the only the only thing that i would that i would say is a is a benefit of um of digitalization is the fact that if you're a mixer, you could very quickly, if something is a little out of sync, you could nudge it, you could nudge it back into sync. You could, you could do just some, some tiny manipulations, you know, to make stuff just a little bit better while the artists are looking for the props for the next cue. Okay. So, right. so I think, I think it's, and it's easier actually to, for the mixer to lay the, lay the show out you know, in the in the Pro Tools format. Although I really love the cue sheets, I, I've always loved cue sheets. Well, well, Greg, yeah. that's a that's a good point, Greg. Now, a, to counter to that too is <clears throat> for digital technology. You know, I'm doing a footstep cue. Guy steps out of a, a cab and runs into his house. Okay. Well, back in the analog days with rock and roll, in other words, projectors going forward, guys out of the car. Okay. He's, oh, I missed that. So stop roll back we can have the dows are open others i can see the projected picture going backwards so then i can really get the get the sync in my head much easier than in digital so there's a point where a counterpoint to that for for us foley artists not for the mixer i guarantee yeah for the mixer you've got a, a bigger palette of things you can do to you know enhance or change or do something to the actual sound that might help it again we always want to be as organic as possible you know, there might be some people that take exception to that, but I always think the best Foley is at least based in that. So anyway. Now this, this next one is uh, from Guy, and this is actually for Greg. So the question is, he said, you mentioned previously that Foley artists have a signature sound and that you could tell uh, who did what. Could you, could you let us know what a distinguishing trademark sound for John is? <laughs> The distinguishing trademark sound for John is that you have no idea, but it's really good, so it must have been Rash. <laughs> <laughs> That's my agent talking right there. Okay, I mean, you, you look at you know when your when your arm starts falling off and you haven't gotten to the bottom of his page yet, you know, it's like is there a movie that he hasn't done? Well, yeah, there's a couple that I did. <laughs> he wasn't on. And and, you know, and Greg, and Greg, I'm interrupting Greg, but not not to forget Alex too. It's not just me; it's the team. So Shelley and Scott, who I'm currently working with, I'm very serious. No, I'm very serious, guys. Right. But, what I, but what I wanted to what I wanted to say is that you, that 
everything that you do is bespoke. Okay, so that, that each picture is different. Every cue that you do is different. The, the, only, the only thing is if that, I mean, you've been widely known for years and years and years for your, for your footsteps. Okay, you, it's the shading. You know, every character is different. And that's the thing about, about being a Foley artist is you, you are an actor. You have to give character to these characters. It's not just simply creating effects. That's, that's the library. Okay, this, to me, Foley is the original sound design. Right. Okay, <laughs> and then actual sound design was taking a sound and manipulating it electronically into something right. else. John Fasal, um, a number, you know, a number of guys, and now everybody's a sound designer. It just it, it sounds so much so much cooler than supervising editor, you know. I have to well, admit, some of them straight a, out of film school or DPs too. So there's a small foley. <laughs> there's a there's a, a a small foley stage in the ranch, you know, um, behind the main house, and uh, I got to go in and do some do a little foley for an independent film someone was there just doing their own thing and we got access to the stage and we we did it something and i was like oh my goodness this is all i ever wanted to do. I, I did you know i was working on i was working on previs for star wars and so i just I, I wasn't able to uh you know i couldn't shift gears but i so wanted to i was just like this is the the most fun i have ever had you know it was just was just trying to make sounds it's just it's just such an amazing job um uh, well alex when alex when the pandemic's over uh ping me and uh, come out and have lunch okay 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 yeah, absolutely all right yeah thank you um uh sky uh uh sky asks uh do you have do you do anything different for dolby atmos or surround not at all not nothing whatsoever in fact we still record in mono but the only time funny enough we'll record in stereo which we do once in a blue moon is if i'm in a cockpit of a plane um because i, I it's weird that spatialization, if you will, this is non-technical Foley John Rush term, gives us a sense of really being enclosed in this thing if you're recording stereo. But outside, and that's like I say, that's another point zero 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 one percent sky. <laughs> so. Go ahead, Jeffrey. Star Trek or Star Wars, and uh, is there anything that you that where they can say they say, hey, I know you worked on the other, but. I don't want you to use this sound or this sound. I want you to create a completely different sound for a phaser or something like that. Yeah, fortunately for me, I've really not experienced that. And I, I, my gut is that really wouldn't happen anyway because, you know, we're all, um, you know, moved to the task at hand. So in other words, for, for working on a, a picture, of course, Star Wars, I really don't handle Star Wars uh, now. That's uh, other people where I work and they do an excellent job. Um, but I had done Empire Strikes Back, and that was only because uh, the ranch had not had a stage built by that time. It was still in its infancy. So, um, um, but, and then we're going to start Trek, you know, again, uh, the, I can say the textures between the two are really interestingly different. Like if you look at the, you know, the TIE Fighters or the, sorry, uh, the X-Wings, you know, you see exhaust, you know, black, etc. cetera, uh, versus in Star Wars, track you know it's like it's clean you know so to, to my mind's eye that's kind of the difference between those two worlds um uh but and we would we would fully that way accordingly but no to answer your question directly um that's never come up thank goodness <laughs> what would you say where, where did you mix up empire did you mix it down at where the main stage was uh that was done on stage d at warner hollywood it's called okay, warner yeah. hollywood back then actually it was a pickford studios then uh, Goldwyn, Warner Hollywood. Now it's called the Lot. All oh, right, right, very good. Yeah, where my offices now are in thirty two ten, where which is what the old Kerner main stage. Yep, yep. yep. So the uh, um, Rajan uh, asks, at what budget does a film start? Wh where does a budget get to where they start adding Foley to it? Uh, where where you see Foley getting added? Because you know, in a lot of films, there isn't as much. You know, a lot of independent films, there's not as much. Well, I think I mean, and, and not to be. Uh, I think that's a the question answers itself. In other words, you know, every hopefully every filmmaker, director slash producer wants the best possible job for their picture, you know. Right. And of course, as we all know, sounds fifty percent, if not more, of the film. Um, you know, number one, dialogue. Let's hear the dialogue, folks. We don't. I mean, I sit in the theater, my wife. I'm not, what'd that guy say? <laughs> wow. Right. Um, 
so and again we can pretty much deal with any i work on documentaries i work on all sorts of things commercials you know um so it really depends upon the overview and understanding what we can do within the time allowed and if that's understood and then acued that way appropriately there's not going to be an issue uh, no matter what the budget is a couple more questions relatively quickly i want to make sure we get through here um what uh, alex goldner asks uh which feature films uh, that talk about Foley do you rec do you recommend, or what what feature films um, that talk about Foley yeah, do you recommend? Oh boy, um, I think I'd you know what I have to get the to get the titles correctly. I'd have to check offline. So is there like an air shoot it to at some point where people see it like in the YouTube yeah. or something or shoot Discord. it to you? Uh, just, oh, Discord. Discord? Yeah, we, we, yeah, but if you send it to Greg or me, uh, we'll I'll put send it to Discord, Greg, or we'll, or we'll try to we'll try to drag you into Discord. <laughs> or come back, come back tomorrow. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah. okay. <laughs> uh, okay, great. Yeah, excellent. Um, uh, yeah, we'd love to get your your references there. Um, Alex also asks, can you? Uh, and I think we already answered this one. Do you deliver uh, record and deliver sound in more than one channel? But pretty much everything you're delivering single channel. Correct. Absolutely. Except yep. for except for the cockpits. Except the confidence. Um, yeah, that's great. Uh, are you the Dark Knight's footsteps? This is from uh, Rajan. Uh, well, depending on which version of Dark Knight, yes. <laughs> <laughs> that's great. <laughs> um, Were there high heels involved? <laughs> yeah, uh, I'm going to say yes, but I and I probably wore some, but only for the backgrounds in uh, one of the scenes where they're all, you know, having champagne. So the. Uh, Rajan asks also, also, uh, what, uh, also, what new tech sounds are you using that you wouldn't have used five years ago? Is there anything new that you're, new things that you're adding into it? I don't know about tech sounds uh, per se, other than um, we would tr cheat to create a very large footstep sound by uh, maybe having a portable floor over, go over what we call a pit cover which is a resonant floor and put the mic literally on that. So as we do the footstep, you're also hearing the resonation below it to create a much lower footstep. Whereas now, of course that can be done with the plugin. So there's that. Um, but again, uh, it depends. Sometimes we will still use the old technique because it sounds better you know, almost in a sense, maybe analog, uh, you know, tubes versus, uh, you know, uh, transistors. So Courtney. There was a great, comic scene that takes place in the movie Modern Romance from 1981 with Albert Brooks. The <laughs> takes place. Oh, sure. <laughs> and they're talking about uh, the footsteps for George Kennedy in the space movie, and he goes, give me Hulk footsteps! Give me the Hulk! And bow, 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 what was that? <laughs> it was the Hulk. Yeah, yeah, actually, on YouTube, there's that clip. You can actually go see that. Like, just type that in, you'll see it. That's great. Uh, Ken Jones said, what was in, I don't, I don't know this one as well, but what was in Fibber McGee's closet from old time radio show? Do you, do you know? uh, uh, Google's your friend on that one. There were actually that certain items that were actually specifically in that closet, uh, closet oh. being of course the, the sound people. And by the way, they, sometimes they call them sound stylists or sound pattern people. Right. Very good. <laughs> uh, Sky, last question. Well, you, you led right into my question because we came from radio and I know BBC is awesome about doing all of the effects. You also mentioned documentary, which you wouldn't think, but you're creating, and I understood the quote, 50% of the film is, is credited to, is, where did you get that quote from? Oh, that's George Lucas. 50% of his films, you know, uh, is sound, which is true. I mean, boy, and, I would, howdy. And then, and then your influence did BBC, uh, where did you get your influence? Why is ought it be, otherwise other than you, you got a job? <laughs> uh, well, I, okay, well, go well with got a job and uh, being an actor, you know. And so I see something on camera and I hear in my mind, okay, well, what do I do? But uh, but if it's picking up a glass, you know, is it a champagne glass where it's a romantic moment, or is it a beer mug? You know, we're going to clink glasses like the Flintstones and break them when we clink. You know what I'm saying? It's all in the attitude behind that, and. Uh, and Alex, if there if there's a moment before we guys want to mention a couple things, but it doesn't have to be now. That's what I was about to ask you. I was about to ask you is if you do you have any resources or places that we can find stuff uh, about what you what you're working on. Okay, well, um, real quick, there's something called the right scuff, 
dot com. They write scuffs all one word. Oh, that's great. that is that is um, my daughter has put that up. It's uh, you can hear interviews with me and my Foley partner, my Foley mixer, and some other people in the industry. Plus uh, uh, Jack Foley's granddaughter, and uh, and it's really wonderful stories about Jack. And then Greg Curta, who will wave here at some point. Uh, he and I, among two other people, are involved with the, what's called the Foley Artist page on Facebook. Now, it is a closed group, but if anybody here is interested, just go there and, you know, read the rules and regs and mention to, hey, I caught you guys on Alex's show and it'll get you right in. Um, it's uh, I think you might find it interesting because it, there's a lot of interesting resources there. And we try to do a lot of different things, too. A children's Foley workshop. Uh we have Foley roundtables where uh, I will actually interview people that I know from the business, uh, not to compete with you, Alex. And, no, no, uh, absolutely. Uh, we, we, we're hoping the, the idea behind this whole thing is to build everything up around this that we don't have enough discussions. And so, okay, how do we do that? So we, we'd love to promote it as often as possible. So if you have oh. things coming up that are live, especially, let us know and we'll announce it. Yeah, we had uh, we had Fred Newman, by the way, recently. He was our last guest. Unbelievable. He's going to come back for sure. Unbelievable. Um, and also we have a discord channel too, but it's all, all in the Foley Arts page. So again, if you want go great, if not, I really, all I can say is I truly, this is not a drill folks. Take this seriously. What's going on out there. Okay. Wear your mask, be safe. And there are some people that aren't doing as well as others. Reach out to them and try to help them, please. That's really important these days. Great. Thanks, John. Thank you so much for, uh, for, for, for being with, here with us. So we really appreciate it. Uh, I mean, it's just been amazing to, to hear, hear these. And I think we could, we could have gone on for a couple hours to ask any <laughs> questions. So, um, but uh, hopefully we'll get you, get you back into some, some discussions in the future. My pleasure, Alex. Thanks so much. And again, a big tip to hat to Greg Curta for helping put this together. Thanks, and uh, Sky, good man. <laughs> All, right. All right. So should All I hang right. on or ring off? What's best? Uh, we're about to, we're, we're going to close it up here in a second. So uh, you okay. can, uh, but um, go ahead and hit it, Mickey. Uh, so we even have it there. So, so uh, uh, remember that tomorrow we're going to be talking about, we're going to shift gears completely and talk about teleprompting. Uh, so we're going to talk about how that works. Courtney's going to be here and talk about the history of, uh, of teleprompting, how it all got started. Uh, Thursday, we have uh, live streaming for musicians. So the tech, uh, we're actually going to get a little music played. Uh, Victor's going to play a little music for us and talk about his pipeline there. Um, and then... Uh, and then we have on Friday, we'll be um, talking about what happens right before live shows. And then on Saturday, we'll, uh, we'll be talking about education. So uh, anyway, a lot of good stuff coming up. And uh, thank you all for coming. We'll see you tomorrow. All right, bye-bye. Thanks, John. Thanks, Greg. Bye, Alex.